Welcome to Fusion News. I'm Jeff Peachman, a PhD student at the University of Washington studying plasma physics and fusion energy. I have four main stories for you today. One, Fusion Pioneer Commonwealth Fusion Systems is selling core magnet tech to the University of Wisconsin. Two, how China's huge industrial supply chain may lead to artificial sun via nuclear fusion. Three, China outspends the US on fusion in the race for energy's holy grail. And four, the nuclear fusion industry is having a growth spurt. And I've got three bonus stories at the end, so stick around. One, Fusion Pioneer Commonwealth Fusion Systems is selling core magnet tech to the University of Wisconsin. So we've covered Commonwealth Fusion Systems a lot on this channel. Their first hardware breakthrough is a superconducting magnet that achieves the 20 Tesla magnetic field. These magnets will be used on the fusion experiment named Spark. Then they'll be adapted for the pilot plant named ARC. Commonwealth recently announced that it will ship a pair of these magnets to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for use on a fusion experiment with the awesome name WAM. This is one of those nested acronyms, so it means Wisconsin HTS Axisymmetric Mirror, and HTS means High Temperature Superconductor. WAM is a magnetic mirror which is entirely different than a tokamak. It's a cylinder with an axial magnetic field, and the field gets very strong at either end. These strong fields can reflect ions back towards the center of the tube, which is why it's called a magnetic mirror. If the particles can be contained for long enough, they can eventually fuse, which releases energy. Bob Mungard, the CEO of Commonwealth Fusion Systems, said, quote, we recognize that these magnets are useful for other things, and if we're going to build a ladder, let's not kick the ladder down. If others are going to come up behind, how can we help them? Personally, I like to applaud this attitude. Many tech companies are inclined to guard their IP so closely that no one else can benefit. And by choosing to supply this key technology to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, they don't need to reinvent the wheel and important research can be conducted faster at lower cost. It also benefits Commonwealth because selling their magnets provides an early revenue stream. And this helps the entire fusion community. I hope to see more of it. As it turns out, the new magnets have already been installed on WAM, and if you'd like to learn more, stick around for the bonus stories. But for now, we're going to pivot to another story about superconducting magnets. Two, how China's huge industrial supply chain may lead to artificial sun via nuclear fusion. So in Shanghai, an experimental fusion device named HH70 made first plasma last month. It's built by a company named Energy Singularity, and they claim that this is the world's first fully high temperature superconducting tokamak. Now I'd like to dispute that claim. I believe that title belongs to ST25HTS, which is a spherical tokamak built by Tokamak Energy. And Tokamak Energy is an FIA member company. However, HH70 is much larger than ST25, and it was built in only two years. So that's an impressive timeline for a device of this size and complexity. Now, if you're a researcher in the fusion community, you're likely excited by the existence of another superconducting tokamak. After all, scientific research is published and shared worldwide, so more data and more experiments are always welcome. However, as fusion technology becomes mature, it's going to become more of an engineering endeavor and much more competitive. So the pace of execution on HH70 raises questions about whether Western fusion efforts are moving fast enough. Some in the US are fearing that fusion could follow the pattern of the solar industry, where much of the technology was invented in the US, but manufacturing came to be dominated by Chinese industry. And there's evidence that China intends to do similar things with fusion. They've made large investments in fusion science, engineering, and the upstream fusion supply chain. So for example, a key feature of HH70 is the use of high temperature superconducting magnets made of REBCO, and that stands for rare earth barium copper oxide. It's the same material being used by Commonwealth as discussed in my last story. REBCO may be a key enabling technology for magnetic confinement fusion. So its properties were discovered back in the 1980s, but the material is so brittle that it took almost 30 years before scientists figured out how to manufacture it as tapes and wires. In 2011, a university laboratory in Shanghai became the first in China to produce 100 meters of REBCO wire and that technology was immediately spun off to form the company Shanghai Semiconductor. 
Today, Shanghai Semiconductor is a major global supplier of the material, and it produced the Repco being used now in HH70. So that's an example of how Chinese industry has invested in its domestic supply chain to enable rapid progress and self-reliance as fusion technology advances. China has taken other steps in this direction. In September, the chairman of China National Nuclear Power said that the first electricity generated by fusion, quote, must come from our country, and we're working towards this goal. Then, Beijing recently announced the creation of a new state-owned company, China Fusion Energy, to pool resources from around the country to make that happen. If China can leverage its expertise in large-scale manufacturing, its vast workforce, and its emerging fusion supply chain, then it might produce fusion power plants which are faster than its Western counterparts, which is a great segue into our next story. So three, China outspends the US on fusion in the race for energy's holy grail. So we all remember the space race of the 1950s and 60s, but now the US may be engaged in a fusion race with China. JP Alain, the head of the DOE's Office of Fusion Energy Sciences, says that China spends 1.5 billion US dollars per year on fusion research, and that's double what the US government spends. He also stated that China's fusion development program is similar to the roadmap published by hundreds of US fusion scientists back in 2020. So essentially, they're beating us at our own plan. They also have 10 times the number of PhDs in fusion science and engineering. So this has made some American scientists and officials where that China will surpass the US in these technologies in a few years. Now at this point, it's not clear who will win the race, but winning or losing may have economic implications. For decades, China invested in the raw materials and the technologies, which will enable the low carbon transition that needs to occur. So for example, China has the most rare earth elements, and we need those to make superconducting magnets. So they have a self-sufficient pipeline from raw materials to the supply chain, to the power plant manufacturers. If they can also make the best fusion power plants at the lowest cost, then the US may become more dependent upon them. Now, obviously the best outcome is for both countries to develop robust and competitive fusion industries. And this competition should reduce the cost for consumers, but also ensure energy security for both of our countries. But can the US keep pace with China and remain competitive? Well, Dennis White, a professor of engineering at MIT claims that it took China about 10 years to build a world-class fusion science program, almost from scratch. In his words, quote, it was almost like a flash that they were able to get there. So the competition is moving fast. For our part, the US has been trying to pick up the pace. In 2022, the Biden administration set a goal, achieve commercial fusion energy within a decade. His administration requested $1 billion for fusion, but Congress didn't provide all of it. So while the US has great policies for fusion, it doesn't have enough funding. One great development is that the Department of Energy has been giving awards to American fusion companies. And what's really cool is that these awards are structured after the COTS program, which is Commercial Orbital Transportation Services. And that's what funded the first Dragon vehicles at SpaceX, which is what I used to work on in my earlier life before grad school. And if it works for space, it might work for fusion. And that brings us to the final main story. Four, the nuclear fusion industry is having a growth spurt. This story is from Axios, and it summarizes the 2024 Global Fusion Industry Report, which is released by the Fusion Industry Association. Over $900 million was directed towards fusion companies in the last year, and three new fusion companies were formed. This brings the total investment in the private fusion industry to over $7.1 billion. Over 426 million of that is public funding, showing the growing role of public-private partnerships. Over 4,000 people are employed by these companies, which is a 34% increase over 2023 and a 300% increase since 2021. 89% of those companies stated that they believe fusion power will be on the grid by the end of the 2030s, and the majority are targeting 2035. So, and I can't stress this enough, fusion is not 30 years away and always will be. We're looking at 10 to 15 years. So that was my last major story today, but I have four bonus stories for you. The first bonus story is wham! Nuclear fusion experiment hits new record for magnet strength. This is a follow-up from today's first story. 
The new magnets from Commonwealth Fusion have already been installed onto the WAM Fusion device, and they're producing magnetic fields of 17 Teslas. That's the strongest magnetic field ever achieved in an operational fusion device. Next is advancements in Z-Pinch Fusion, new insights from plasma pressure profiles. And this story covers the plasma configuration that I work on, which is the sheared flow stabilized Z-Pinch. It's the same approach being commercialized by Zap Energy, which is actually where I'm filming this. Scientists from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory were able to measure the electron temperature and density of a flow Z-Pinch at Zap to understand the plasma conditions that coincided with fusion neutron production. The measurement was performed using Thompson scattering, which is the gold standard for determining these types of numbers. This Thompson scattering setup is portable, allowing it to be transported to different fusion companies so that independent researchers can verify the progress of American fusion companies. The next story is Kiwi physicist puts New Zealand in the nuclear fusion race. The story is about a new fusion company called OpenStar. They plan to build a levitating dipole device, which has the advantage of very stable plasma confinement. The disadvantage is that it requires a superconducting donut massing several tons, which needs to magnetically levitate in the middle of a vacuum chamber. And that's a really cool engineering challenge. It's a, it's a great project, it's a really cool project, and I wish them a lot of luck. And the final bonus story is split the fusion regulation from fission is codified by new law. I've actually been reporting on this story for a while. Uh, so last year, I reported that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission determined that fusion would be regulated under the framework which is used for particle accelerators. And this framework is much less restrictive than that used for nuclear fission. And that decision by the NRC had bipartisan support in Congress. So the House and the Senate included this policy in the Advance Act, which I reported a few months back. Now, President Biden has just signed the Advance Act into law, which is really great news for the industry. And that's it for the Fusion News this week. I hope you had a great time. And if you found this helpful, maybe hit like and subscribe. Once again, I'm Jeff Peachman, and thanks for joining me.